Hello folks, welcome back to World War II TV. Slightly late to start today, but who cares? It's one worth waiting for. If you haven't already seen our guest's previous show, it's in the description below. Uh, that's when we talk about the book. So our guest today is Henry Sledge, son of Eugene Sledge. So you know the story with the old breed, of course, a major character in the Pacific TV series. And if, if you haven't watched the Pacific series, then watch it after this. If you haven't read the book, then read it after this. But the first show we talked about the writing of the book, dealing with growing up in, you know, with his father dealing with the fame from the book and so and so. So we did all that in the first show. Today, we're going to talk about the Peleliu, the Battle of Peleliu, and also Henry's experience retracing his father's steps um, on the island several years later. I will just extend at the beginning of the show a hearty thank you to Brian Dimitrovich, himself a guest on World War II TV a number of times for the amazing modern photos of Peleliu that we are going to be using today. So thank you, Brian, for that. And as always, folks, if you've just joined the channel, please don't forget to subscribe and click the little button so that you get the notifications. Without further ado, I'm going to introduce Henry. So um, good afternoon, Henry. How are you doing today? Doing well, Paul. How are you? I'm very well. So you know, silly question before we start. Do you ever get bored talking about this? I don't no. think you do, do you? No, it's coming from the heart. I never do. It is literally one of my driving passions. Yeah, no, it's 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 important to, to always look back. And we, we talked about the, the, your reasons for doing it in the first show. But Peleliu, that's the big one. It's the, it's, I mean, every island campaign had its unique qualities. But Peleliu definitely has this, this, um, collective memory of just it being generally awful it didn't seem to have that that victorious bit that came during it the Iwo Jima battle of course was terrible but there was that kind of sense of victory and getting Peleliu right. just seems to be unrelenting horror and misery for everybody who's there so that's what we'll talk about today but folks we have got an amazing number of images to show with you tonight so we're going to just sort of chat and talk about things and Peleliu and talk about Eugene Sledge's journey across Peleliu, and then Henry's journey, was it 44 years later? 40? It, it was the 55th anniversary, 55th so 1999. Anniversary. Cool. So here we go. So Peleliu, let give just a tiny two-minute background on Peleliu, Henry, just where it came in the campaign and what the reasons were for the Marines attacking it. So Peleliu was attacked. Peleliu was invaded September of 1944. So to contextualize that, we had already been through Guam, Saipan, Guadalcanal was a distant memory, uh, if that's possible, certainly not to give short shrift to that iconic event. But MacArthur was driving through the Southwest Pacific. Nimitz and the United States Navy were driving through the Central Pacific. It was a, a bifurcated attack plan, if you will. It, Peleliu was deemed to be of importance because of a rather substantial Japanese air base on the island. Uh, it was a Japanese naval air base, not Japanese army air force. But it was determined, Peleliu, tiny island, two miles by six miles. The import, It was deemed to be important because as MacArthur advanced on the Philippines, Peleliu was on his right flank. We f It was felt by strategists at the time that that air power and airfield needed to be neutralized as MacArthur advanced on Mindanao. Um, in late 1944. And so that's how it became into the attack plan. Now, as things went on, Admiral Halsey with Task Force 58 went through the area several months prior and then very close to the invasion with a large number of carrier plane raids to uh, feel out Japanese air power and suppress it if necessary. And then they moved on to the Philippines doing the same thing. Halsey reported back to Nimitz that he felt we did not need to attack Peleliu because his carrier pilots in their F6F Hellcats and SBDs and, and TBF Avengers were coming back saying, we're not finding hardly any Japanese aerial resistance. Uh, we're knocking out a bunch of them on the ground, but as far as air-to-air -air resistance, we're not seeing any. So the questions began to arise at that point maybe we don't need to attack Peleliu. And in fact, Bull Halsey himself said, I fear another Tarawa. Mm. And Tarawa, to contextualize this even more, was November of 43. We're now in September of 44. But for reasons that he never really explained, Chester Nimitz 
felt that the invasion train was set in motion and we would invade Peleliu. Um, and so there we go. The 1st Marine Division, along with the 81st U.S. Army Infantry Division, providing uh, backup, invaded September 15th, 1944. And that was my father, Eugene Sledge. That was his baptism of fire. Yeah. And folks, that's all we're going to talk about, the whether or not it should have been invaded, because that's a discussion for the, the people to pull on their beards and the people who write a, the big trilogies and books about the Pacific campaign. We're here to talk about the Marines going across that hellhole. And of course, if you're there, whatever unit you're in, even if you're just piloting a landing craft or, or you know an Amtrak, you're just thinking about staying alive they're not thinking about contextualizing the rationale of the pacific campaign and are we doing the right strategy that was the last thing on their mind they were thinking about uh keeping uh alive and later on just the fact they were thirsty which will come into it a lot of course this conversation so let's dive straight in and talk about the landing site so um the weird thing about Peleliu today and the, the modern photos we're going to be sharing with you folks folks is it's very lush and beautiful and it's got this sense of a you know tropical island and and kind of hula dances and it looks beautiful now of course back at the time it was absolute hell on earth the naval bombardments the air pounding it had this looked like a, a an alien environment didn't it so I know we'll talk about the, the, your visit later on but when you prepared yourself mentally to go there back for that anniversary visit how difficult was it to kind of prepare for the fact that what you were going to see was not really what your father was going to had seen at the time? Well, I had watched a tremendous amount of archival footage uh, at that point in time. This was 1999. So in 1995, Lou Reader Productions had done a video about Peleliu, uh, had a lot of interviews with my father in it. And also I think Colonel Joe Alexander, who was on my trip, uh, had a great deal of input on that. Uh, he was one of the narrators of it, actually. But uh, I knew that, of course, you know, back then, Woody, we didn't have Google Earth. Yeah. You know, I mean, we now you can go literally and find a street view of something. Of course, they don't have that on Peleliu quite yet. But uh, that kind of thing wasn't around in 1999. But I, I knew that it was very overgrown and nothing was going to look the way it did to the Marines in 1944 and the soldiers in 1944. Yeah, uh, but yeah, and that's why the photos will look particularly kind of attractive in a sense day. But when we show the wartime photos, you'll see the contrast of hell and, and, and pleasant air. But that map there, which is the bottom of the island there, the right. three areas we're going to be talking about initially in this show are the landings on Orange Beach, the airfield, which obviously is the cross in the middle there, and the mangrove swamps to the to the right of that. And then later on, we're going to be going elsewhere on the island. But that's kind of our first arena of, of combat. And as you said, it, it's not a massive place, Peleliu. I mean, it's, it's it's an incredible amount of fighting in a very condensed. And you can you can walk it essentially, can't you? You you can. I mean, the entire island is six miles long. So yeah, it's very small. So there we are. This this is the landing. So this, this is the images we see, and these the, the D days were the same in a sense. Every day, it's always sort of about a assault wave rushing up the beach there. Um, and there are D-Days throughout the Pacific as there were in the ETO. But this is your father's first D-Day. So we, while we've got a couple of these wartime images there, what you're going to do today for us is read some of the passages from your father's book. So right. um, let's, let's hear your father's memories of landing on that beach. Okay. Our machine started with a jerk, and we held onto the sides and to each other. The Amtrak's treads ground and scraped against the iron ridges on the ramp. Then it floated freely and settled onto the water like a big duck. Around us roared the voices of the ships engaged in the pre-assault bombardment of Peleliu's beaches and defensive positions. The Marine Corps had trained us new men until we were welded with the veterans into a thoroughly disciplined combat division. Now the force of events unleashed on that two-mile by six-mile piece of unfriendly coral of rock would carry us forward unrelentingly, each to his individual fate. Everything my life had been before and has been after pales in the light of that awesome moment when my Amtrak started in amid a thunderous bombardment toward the flaming smoke shrouded beach for the assault on Peleliu. Wow. That, that was, you know, obviously just in which, and I thought in the Pacific, they portrayed it brilliantly, by the way, um, with the landing and showing them coming out of the LST. That's, that's me on orange beach too. 
which was the the beach that K three five landed on. I've, I can read a little bit more on the landing yeah, if you want. Yeah. Okay. And just by the way, I did watch those three episodes this afternoon. That was that was my work this afternoon, folks. Watching three yeah. episodes of the Pacific. That's a pretty cool job I, to have. I, I thought they were brilliantly handled. I mean, you know, the part when when it shows them getting into the Amtrak and you you hear those radial engines, you know, cranking up. And yeah. I mean, hearing my father describe it, but but yeah, let's let's jump on forward with a, a little bit of the landing here. Our bombardment began to lift off the beach and move inland. Our dive bombers also moved inland with their strafing and bombing. The Japanese increased the volume of their fire against waves of Amtraks. Above the din, I could hear the ominous sound of shell fragments humming and growling through the air. Stand by, somebody yelled. I picked up my mortar bag and slung it over my left shoulder. Buckled my chin strap, adjusted my carbine sling over my right shoulder, and tried to keep my balance. My heart pounded. Our Amtrak came out of the water and moved a few yards up the gently sloping sand. Hit the beach, yelled an NCO moments before the machine lurched to a stop. The men piled over the sides as fast as they could. I followed Snafu, climbed up and planted both feet firmly on the left side so as to leap as far away from it as possible. At that instant, a burst of machine gun fire with white hot tracers snapped through the air at eye level, almost grazing my face. I pulled my head back like a turtle, lost my balance and fell awkwardly forward down onto the sand in a tangle of ammo bag, pack, helmet, carbine, gas mask, cartridge belt, and flopping canteens. Get off the beach. Get off the beach. Race through my mind. Wow. Um, and, and here it is today. This is some footage I was sent by, by Dez, who, who lives on the island. It's, it's not the greatest quality, but it gives a sense of it. And this is this sort of tropical idyll that we see today. And it's, it's so weird, in a sense, seeing this today and then hearing your father's harrowing account because... You yeah, know, that absolutely. you said the TV show does show that it, you know, when you see the, the Amtrak's approaching it, it looks like Verdun in 1915 or something. Mm -hmm. All the trees are stripped away of foliage, the beach is all pockmarked, there's smoke everywhere. Um, you know, so t tell us about your first visit to the beach there, what it was like walking there and, and, and going through your father's footsteps. Yeah, well, so it, getting to Pelu itself is an adventure, but uh. We actually flew into, if you fly into Peleliu, you fly into Babelthorpe, which is, or Babeldobe, as some people call it. All, all the Plowing Islands have alternate names. But we uh, we stayed on Babelthorpe the first, or, or Karora. You fly into Babelthorpe, then go to Karora, which is where most people in, in the Palau Islands actually live. Uh, we went down to Peleliu, but then it's an hour boat ride just to get to Peleliu itself. Nobody flies into the island, even though you still have you know, the remains of the airfield, which we'll get to later. But, um, you know, we came in on the North Shore of Peleliu, then we piled into vans and, and drove down West Road. Um, and one of the guys on the tour said to me, he said, man, it's it's all, and he had done a lot of these tours. He said, it, the landing beach is always so emotional for people. Um, and he said, I guess that's where, because it's where it all started. And uh, I would agree with that, Woody. I mean, to, to, to see that, what you see right there, um, and to know that what I just read had happened and my father was part of it. I mean, it, it was, you know, I got a lump in my throat. I, I got to be honest. I really did. Uh, I, I could have spent an entire day just on the landing beach, honestly. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and we didn't just stay. That's on Orange Beach, which is one of the southern <clears throat> one of the southern landing beaches where seventh marines and fifth marines went ashore farther north is white beach one and two that's where the first marines went ashore and of course in the pacific main character robert lecky went ashore on white beach and those guys ran into a maelstrom i mean nobody had it easy on the beach d-day at peleliu but on white beach white beach one and white beach two i mean the coral which we have some photos of was just horrendous. I mean, it was hard to even walk around in it. I couldn't imagine there, right there. So in that photograph right there, I'm on White Beach. The guy you see in the white hat there is, I think I'm actually on the point right there, Woody, which was an iconic uh, location. And in fact, a book was written by George Hunt, who was in K Company 3rd Battalion, 1st Marines, about, well, about his experience on Peleliu. But they assaulted the point. I mean, in that water right there around those rocks, a friend of mine who was on the trip, or he was really the main, I think, source of knowledge, a guy named Eric Maylander, uh, and he's probably out there right now. He and I have corresponded. 
he said, Henry, imagine right here in this water, there were 50 dead Marines at one point with more coming in and more taking fire. That's Colonel Joe Alexander, who actually, I think that position and the point was taken out by a rifle grenade. And Colonel Alexander is actually in the position from which that grenade was fired, if I remember correctly. I mean, it has been 23 years now since I was there, yeah. which is hard to and believe. I was, but. I was chatting to Brian today, and he said, if you, if you get a chance to talk about White Beach and the point, because he said that's kind of, if you're going to give it a scale, that's the Omaha beach of, of, of the landings here. That was the kind of the worst bit with the worst losses in the first wave. And, you know, and yet your father's experience as portrayed in a TV show, it's hell on earth. But of course, things got actually worse for your father's unit as they went in towards the airfield there. But, and it's, you know, that always reminder that the invasion getting ashore on the beach is only the first step. You've got objectives right. in land and as we know in world war ii some beach landings go incredibly well there's no no right. enemy there it were jima things were quite quiet on the beach and they got hell hell later you never know what you're going to get in that first bit there but you've got to then press on in and and and, and move towards your next objective which in our case is and there's a photos of the of the, some of the monuments things there. again these are courtesy of brian these these modern digital right photos. So thanks very much brian you want a couple of paragraphs on on what after he hit hit the beach or you want to keep moving yeah no let's, let's do that yeah please okay once i felt land under my feet i wasn't as scared as i had been coming across the reef my legs dug up the sand as i tried to rise a firm hand gripped my shoulder oh god i thought it's a nip who's come out of a pillbox i couldn't reach my k-bar fortunately because i got my face out of the sand and looked up there was the worried face of a Marine bending over me. He thought the machine gun burst had hit me and he had crawled over to help. When he saw I was unhurt, he spun around and started crawling rapidly off the beach. I scuttled after him very quickly. If you can see it, that's the K-bar up on the wall. Yeah, yeah. Top, top, that's my dad's K-bar. But shells, just two more paragraphs and I'll be, I'm done reading with that. Shells crashed all around. Fragments tore in words, slapping on the sand and splashing into the water all around us. Uh, splashing into the water a few yards behind us. The Japanese were recovering from the shock of our pre-landing bombardment. Their machine gun and rifle fire got thicker, snapping viciously overhead and increasing volume. Our Amtrak spun around and headed back out as I reached the edge of the beach and flattened on the deck. The world was a nightmare of flashes, violent explosions, and snapping bullets. Most of what I saw blurred. My mind was benumbed by the shock of it. Wow. I'm going to end up saying wow a lot today because it, it is it is going to be wow moments and um um and but yeah let's move in towards the airfield because we've got a lot of stuff to cover a lot of ground to cover today folks so yeah the airfield you saw it on the map there folks so just in lab the beaches is the airfield and as we know your father's unit kind of end up approaching kind of from the south or the the, the, the south uh, west there um and we've got lots of period photos and we've got your photos of your trip and we've got Brian's photos of his trip there so. This is you visiting it now. Now, of course, obviously, the, the jungle has encroached a lot right. onto this <clears throat> wide open space there. And lots of the, the German defenses have gone away. But there's still some stuff there. So, again, you know, we'll, we'll do your father's description of, of crossing that open ground there. Because mm -hmm. this, this wasn't just one rush. They, they, they tried on the first day, then stopped. And it was overnight. And this was a, this was a real baptism of fire. The beach was bad. This, this was where it just got really, really awful. But, again... Before we get into your father's account, there you are standing there. What was it like standing there for the first time, you know, having read all your father's account and talked to your father about it? What was it like standing there? Well, I told uh, <clears throat> Eric Maylander, who who at that point was guiding us around the island, I said, Eric, I want to I want to hit that airfield approximately right where K-35 went across. He said, OK, man, I'm, I'm going to put you right there. And so we, we drove to that location in a van, hiked through a little bit of scrub growth, not much, but I got out and, and Colonel Alexander, Joe, as I called him and incidentally ended up naming my son after Joe Alexander. But, um, you know, I remember him saying, Hey, Henry, we're just going to leave you alone. You know, we'll take some pictures of you. Just walk around. Uh, but, but that, you know, the airfield was really in, into their eyes. That was like the, the main thing that was their number one goal at first the whole reason for being there. So D plus one was when they, when they did attack across the airfield and secured it. <clears throat> and we'll, we'll, I've got another little video clip there. We'll just put in there. Yeah, Again, yeah, it's a very that's... short one, but it gives an idea. This was taken about a week ago, folks. And uh, so, you know, it's, 
it it doesn't look much like it would have done when you know the Marines are approaching it that you know that first time. But it gives you a sense of the space. It gives you a sense of the environment. So, um, well, do you want to do your father's account of, of attacking across the? Yeah, let's there? do a little bit of that. Um, let's see. As I lay on the blistering hot coral and looked across the open airfield, heat waves shimmered and danced, distorting the view of Bloody Nose Ridge. A hot wind blew in our faces. An NCO hurried by, crouching low and yelling, keep moving out there, you guys. There's less chance you'll be hit if you go across fast and don't stop. Let's go, shouted an officer who waved toward the airfield. We moved at a walk, then a trot, in widely dispersed waves. Four inf infantry battalions from left to right, 2-1, two, 1-5, one, one, five, two, five, and 3-5, this put us on the edge of the airfield, moved across the open, fire-swept airfield. My only concern then was my duty and survival, not panoramic combat scenes. But I often wondered later what that attack looked like to aerial observers and those not immersed in the firestorms. All I was aware of were the small area immediately around me and the deafening noise. I can go on, but... No, please go on for a bit. Well, I'll keep okay. going through the photos. Go on a little bit more. This is brilliant stuff. I don't, I don't want people to be like, Jesus, all we're doing is listening to him read the book, but... Bloody Nose Ridge dominated the entire airfield. The Japanese had concentrated their heavy weapons on high ground. These were directed from observation posts at elevations as high as 300 feet from which they could look down on us as we advanced. I could see men moving ahead of my squad, but I didn't know whether our battalion, 3rd Battalion, 5th, was moving across behind 2-5, 2nd Battalion, 5th, and then wheeling to the right. There were also men about 20 yards to our rear. We moved rapidly in the open in craters and coral rubble, through, through ever-increasing enemy fire. I saw men to my right and left running, bent as low as possible. The shells screeched and whistled, exploding all around us. In many respects, it was more terrifying than the landing because there were no vehicles to carry us along, not even the thin steel, thin steel sides of an Amtrak for protection. We were exposed, running on our own power through a veritable shower of deadly metal and the constant crash of explosions. Well... Wow. And, and these photos here, I mean, we don't want to be, this isn't a review of the TV show, but having just watched it, they did an in incredible job matching up the details of the Japanese aircraft, the buildings, the the over the, the, the concrete structures, the bunkers around it. I mean, you know, when you when you first saw the TV show, it must have been quite a revelation to kind of visually give you an idea of what it was like. You'd had the words before, you'd seen documentaries, and you'd been there, but seeing it brought to life must have been again another incredible moment well yeah and i mean it, it was done amazingly well and you know you have to you have to think about it woody i mean it was 115 degrees that day yeah you know i mean when i was there i remember eric maylander had a compass with a uh with a thermometer on it if i recall correctly and, and you know it was 85 90 you know it might have gotten up close to 100 but it would have been with the denuded vegetation or total lack of vegetation that the Marines were dealing with on D-Day, D plus one and two, you know, and, and then the soldiers, the 81st from there on afterward, uh, it would have been even hotter because it was white coral constantly reflecting back on you. Yeah. And this is the, you know, the, we talk about the importance of visiting battlefields and for those who can have the time and the money to travel to battles, of course, it's amazing standing at Monte Cassino or, or Warsaw or wherever it would be, but to try and recreate the conditions, because when you're there as a tourist, you've probably had a decent breakfast. No one is shooting at you. You have not seen your best friend yeah. been shot through the leg or whatever it would be. So it's very different visiting a battlefield with a tour group and well, everybody get back on the bus and let's have yeah. a a can of soda before we go on to our next stop. It's a very different experience there. But again, we'll talk about the visiting to the, the area because I say some of the buildings are there. And the, the main iconic one is the, the Japanese headquarters, the building there. So that's right. what it looked like at the time, folks. These photos are taken either days or weeks, or in fact, sometimes even years after combat because some of the aerial photos of the airfield were taken in 45. And, and by mm -hmm. then, it's almost like a metropolis by then. The, the, right. the finished base there was nothing like it was there when your father was there in those first few days. But that's the iconic building there that you see. Mm -hmm. And what um, you, when you see that, like, the masonry really crumpled in, like, major structural damage, that would have been done from our battleships. Yeah. From from the, the Mississippi with its 14-inch guns and the Alabama, or, well, yeah, I think the Alabama was it probably. But, but the other battleships had 16-inch guns, firing salvos. You, know, you want me to read a little bit more on the airfield? Yeah, or? and, and about, if you're thinking about the buildings, that'd be fantastic. 
Yeah, I actually, he doesn't say anything about the buildings, even though that featured prominently in, in the episode when they got across. Uh, he doesn't mention anything about that here, but uh, just just a little bit. Sure. I'll, I'll read. For me, the attack resembled World War I movies I had seen of suicidal Allied infantry attacks through shell fire on the Western Front. I clenched my teeth, squeezed my carbine, carbine stock, and recited over and over to myself, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff comfort me. The sun bore down unmercifully, and the heat was exhausting. Smoke and dust from the barrage limited my vision. The ground seemed to sway back and forth under the concussions. I felt as though I were floating along in the vortex of some surreal thunderstorm. Japanese bullets snapped and cracked, and tracers went by me on both sides at waist height. This deadly small arms fire seemed almost insignificant amid the erupting shells. Explosions and the hum and growl of shell fragments shredded the air. Chunks of blasted coral stung my face and hands, while steel fragments splattered down on the hard rock like hail on a city street. Everywhere, shells flashed like giant firecrackers. Crazy stuff. And and here the bit so here's your trip. Here's here's 1999. Of course, yep. even since your trip to Brian's trip, things have changed there again because now there's a bit. I mean, tourism was going there. Obviously, that's how you were there. But now there is tourism based on your and There's a bit more in the way of, of, of trips there. Obviously, COVID has affected things. But right. you know, when you were there that first time and with the, the group members, what you know, you you had the personal connection. I'm guessing on that trip, most of the people on that trip had some kind of connection with the battle. Um, yeah, it was, uh, well, in fact, I'll, I'll just say this anecdotally, when, when the whole way this trip started, I'd gone down to visit my parents, I lived about 30 minutes north of them at that point in time, and something had come in the mail, a flyer from Military Historical Tours, about 55th anniversary trip to Peleliu. And my dad handed it to me and said, hey, this might interest you. I know you've talked about someday wanting to go to Peleliu. So I filled it out, sent it in. Um, you know, nowadays you would do it all online, but not in 1999. And a couple of days later, I get a really enthusiastic phone call from uh, from someone. And they write because on the forum, you had to say, you know, obviously who you were. Mm -hmm. Did you have a relative? You know, were you just a historian? Were you just interested in, in the battle? And I put, you know, yeah, my father was K-35, Eugene Sledge, you know, and of course, get a phone call. Oh, you know, Henry, wow, we're so excited you're coming on this trip. Uh, and they said, would your father be interested in, in coming? Uh, because if, if he wants to go, he'll get an all expense paid package. And uh, so I said, well, I think I know what the answer is going to be, but I will go ask him. And so I did. And, and, you know, Woody, my dad had a really wry, dry sense of humor. And I said, well, dad, they, they'd love it if you would go. They said they'd give you an all expense paid trip. <laughs> He said, tell them I've already had an all-expense-paid trip to Peleliu. I'm not interested in another one. <laughs> That's a, it's a very good response. Yeah, it, it is. And it does, you know, we talked about it in the first show. The Some veterans want to return to their battlefields. Mm -hmm. Some don't. Some want to go to reunions. Some don't. Some have that one friend they keep in touch with. Others keep in touch with all of them. Others have no contact. It's an everybody's experience is completely different and, and exactly. visiting battlefields with veterans and, and their family members is, 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 is always going to be a different experience for everybody. But again, without sounding like me repeating myself, what's it like standing in those buildings? Cause that's the tangible reminder. Cause, and these are Brian's photos because you can see the impacts of shells. You can see the, 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 the shrapnel damage there. And now they have these relics and things. Right. What, what people do is it like you, you see, actually, I think I see a 60 millimeter, Mortar shell there. I think I yeah. see a 75. You see canteens. Uh, you know, everywhere you look, people would find the detritus of war and they would tend to group it on a monument, just like you see there. Yeah. Uh, but standing in those buildings, knowing that that was the seat of Japanese power in on the Palau, well, in, on Peleliu, obviously there was a major uh, headquarters assembly area or headquarters structure on Koror. Uh, but Colonel Nakagawa, Colonel Kunio Nakagawa, who was in charge of the Japanese troops on Peleliu, you know, to know that that's where that was the seat of their power. Now, obviously, by the time the Marines moved in, they had pulled back and gotten into the caves. You know, there I don't think Colonel Nakagawa and his staff 
and if Eric Maylander's watching, if somebody can can fill me in on that, I I doubt by the time Marines went across the airfield, they were there. I think they would have pulled back into the Umar Brogel. Right. But to walk yeah. around, and yeah, really, really cool sight to see that. Yeah, and, and and especially, you know, because it kind of stands there with the jungle going, being part of it now. It's be, like, like the Atlantic Wall bunkers here in Normandy or other parts of Europe. The nature is absorbing it, and it's becoming part of the natural environment now over right. the years. And The and jungle is reclaiming its own. Yeah, and, and you know, you wonder what it's going to be like in, in 50 years' time or 100 years' time, how much will still be left. And uh, But again, thank you to Brian for these amazing photos. And you can just get a sense of it. And if you have, like I have, and some people watching have just watched the episodes, you can see, again, what a fantastic job they did matching everything up and, and, and getting oh, yeah. across that sense of the, of the area. But, of course, you know, at the time, there'd be much more cut-back jungle. There'd be much greater views. Now it's all around it. But it, it, gives, you the, it gives you an idea. And there's the impact on it there. So um, any more uh, you know, memories of, of your father on that airfield or your reaction to being there? Well, I'll read one more paragraph from the airfield. Please do. Um, Through the haze, I saw Marines stumble and pitch forward as they got hit. I then looked neither right nor left, but just straight to my front. The further we went, the worse it got. The noise and concussion pressed in on my ears like a vice. I gritted my teeth and braced myself in anticipation of the shock of being struck down at any moment. It seemed impossible that any of us could make it across. We passed several craters that offered shelter, but I remembered the order to keep moving. Because of the superb discipline and excellent esprit of the Marines, it had never occurred to us that the attack might fail. So I'll, I'll stop there. Yeah. And, and there you are again. And, and, and again, you can see, folks, when we have the more recent photos, again, these vehicles have been, some of them are exactly where they are. Some of them have been dragged around a bit because tourism right. has brought in things there. But you've got the Japanese tanks and, and, and relics there. That's, and then, a, that's an OVTA-4. An and then you've got, say, you've got the American relics as well. So the, you've got these two things side by side. So when you're there with the, with the tour group again, you're seeing these reminders of the Japanese equipment, the American e equipment, but kind of facing each other, like left almost where they were standing. That must have conveyed just how close quarters some of this combat was. And, you know, we, we talk about sometimes battles being won by artillery firing five right. miles and an air pad. This, the Pacific is, it's up close and personal, isn't it? Yeah, I heard my father describe Peleliu like two scorpions in a bottle. And to see that's an LVTA one, I believe, yeah. with a 37 millimeter on it. Um, you know, I, I never wanted to leave, Woody. I mean, I, I could take that and put it in my backyard, and my wife will get really mad when I say that. Is <laughs> she we joke about that, but now that's a Japanese type 95 tank yeah. near the airfield, which incidentally, that that was really one of the few cases, I believe, where you had American armor directly encountering Japanese armor in, in yeah. the Pacific. Yeah, you know, and and first Marine Tank Battalion, and they were pulled off Peleliu after a week, and then the Marines got support from the 710th Tank Battalion, which was an Army outfit, and they did a fine job uh, and worked very well with the Marines. But for the first few days, it was the first Marine Tank Battalion, and uh, you know, my dad, they're they're seeing these Sherman tanks coming in and grouping up and firing on the the Japanese tanks, you know, across the airfield. And of course, the, the Sherman 75s could usually knock out. I think I think the Jap type, the Japanese Type 95 tanks had quarter inch armor, and the Shermans with their 75s could take them out pretty easily. Uh, but you know, the, the bravery of the Japanese soldiers can never be questioned. I mean, because you know they would. There were cases of Japanese snipers securing themselves in nets to the sides of those tanks and shooting at the Marines as they're coming across. But I. I think that the Japanese armor was wiped out pretty quickly in the airfield encounter. Yeah, and I think you're right about it being one of the few occasions where armor met armor. I mean, we did a show last week about the Stuarts uh, uh, in New Guinea, and, right. and in that particular battle, there was no Japanese armor there. So a Stuart tank, when there's no other enemy tanks, is is the king of the battlefield. If there's a Stuart tank and there's yeah. German Panzer Falls or there's something bigger, it's it's not the king of the battlefield. But in this environment, yeah, you know, when these Japanese tanks wreaked havoc against exposed infantry running across the airfield but when m4 shermans come in it's a very different ball game and yeah you know, and we talked about it in the previous show because when mm -hmm. you're a marine as your dad was you know the marines win the war your marines are your loyalty is to your men and your squad and your company you know, did 
did did he talk about the respect he had for perhaps the naval gunners or the tankers or the other people like that? Did he feel it was a group effort? Absolutely. Um, now you know as as the, as the battle wore on and and their conditions of depravity just got worse and worse, the people that they they didn't have any or I'll say limited respect for were the rear echelon guys who came up souvenir hunting. Yeah. And literally in some cases passed through the front lines on bloody nose Ridge when they didn't know where the front lines were enough about that. He had tremendous respect as I think all the infantrymen did for the Naval gunners, what they were doing. Um, I know he had a tremendous amount of respect for the Marine fighter pilots. Mm. which on, on D plus one, they were not there. VMF 114 came in, I think on D plus 11 on September 26th. Uh, but their ground echelon guys were there early on to try to get things set up. But yeah, I mean, absolutely. You know, he, he described, and I, I can't hunt for it as we move along through the show. Uh, but, you know, he, he described the, the 16 inch salvos as their, churning past in their amphibious tractors in the way in the assault waves, you know, and they got out past the battleships, those 16 inch salvos were like thunderclaps. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and he said, you just cannot imagine every time one of those things went off, it was like a thunderclap. And they could actually see, and he, he, he de described it to me when I was a kid, the, the shells, if you saw them off in the distance, the 16 inch shells looked about the size of your thumb hmm. and they would come in in groups of three and they would see them, you know, in little, shapes moving across the sky um exploding out in front of them as they're heading in on the, in the amphibious tractors and this is why i think i always suggest to folks if they're reading a book like like your father's book or bob lecky's book or in the eto don baguette people like that is as brilliant as they are it's kind of also worth having another book open one of those kind of ian w toll kind of books so you can oh, kind yeah. of you see it from the ground, the ground up that, that, that sergeant or private running across a beach. And then you can kind of turn to the other page and talk about the salvos of rockets and the, the air power, because any one soldier is only seeing it through that little, little environment there. And I had a combat veteran told me that being in combat is like having a bucket over your head with a one inch diameter hole in it. And you're looking at through that all the time. And right. all you're catching <clears throat> is glimpses of things and you don't, your, your world reduces. You're not necessarily noticing the aircraft flying over and, the, and the, the naval salvos coming in because you're just trying to stay alive. So keeping kind of two books open and having your Google Maps open as well is a modern way of reading, I suppose. Isn't right. It? And it's a great way to understand the battle, but you are absolutely correct, Woody. I mean, there is, you know, he, he well, I think he described in the part I read on going across the airfield. I mean, his world became reduced to just what was directly in yeah. front of him. And, you know, to his left and right, he could see Marines stumbling and, and getting hit, but they had to keep moving. Uh, and in fact, you know, halfway across uh, or pretty close to it, Snafu took a hit and fell. Yeah. And, you know, I, I mean, he writes about it, but I remember and they showed it. They showed it in the in yeah. the miniseries. Yeah, but, uh, you know, I remember my dad describing to me, you know, he he stopped and helped him up. And there was that one inch square piece of metal that was a shell fragment. Yeah. And he, my dad's bouncing in his hand because it was still hot. And Snafu, of course, it was so loud they couldn't talk. And he's motioning to put it in in his pack. And so my dad took it and dropped it in Snafu's pack. Man, that'd wow. be a relic I'd like to have. Yeah, that'd be cool, wouldn't <laughs> it? Yeah. Um, but we're going to keep on pressing on because one of the areas that is kind of difficult to photograph because you, if you go inside, it's dark and it's difficult, are the, are the mangrove swamps. Because we've got the right. open areas where the airfields are. We've got the beaches. Then we've got the, the big Hill 140 and Bloody Ridge and the and Bloody Nose Ridge. They're kind of high ground. But then you've got the swamps. So set the scene. You know, you, you know you're know, you from Alabama. I know down the south in the USA, you've got different types of climate and geography down there. But your first visit there, 1999, the first time you kind of saw these swamps and you went in there, what, what again, what was that like? Well, it was overwhelming just to, to imagine the heat, the humidity, the lack of water, you know, because remember, clean drinking water was, was at a premium because they didn't have any for several days. The only water they had had been floated ashore in the, the fuel drums that they had steamed out. Um, but... You know, the, the mangrove swamp was really an iconic area, Woody, because it's several days into the battle, they were sent, K-35 or K Company, uh, was sent on a patrol, which, and my father, I'll, I'll read a little bit about it here, but some pretty, some pretty bleak, dark stuff happened that night. 
out in the mangrove, what's known as the mangrove swamp. And Eric Maylander took us right to it. That's my photo of it. Um, but well, let me, let me just read this. So, yeah. but they, the, the reason they were sent out into the mangrove swamp was to probe for Japanese. They thought the Japanese were out there in strength. My dad actually, I, I heard him speak in an interview many years later where he had talked to Sergeant Johnny Marmet, who was one of their sergeants, uh, who said, Sledgehammer, what I knew then, but I couldn't tell you guys, was that was a death patrol. We were a suicide patrol. And my dad said, when when Johnny told me that, my knees just about buckled. Wow. But they were, but let, just, just a quick... Yeah, please, 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 from, please from, this is an important part there. And again, yeah. I don't think, as great as your photo is, I don't think it really conveys to us because we've got no smell, we've got no sound, we've mm. got no chirping insects, but we'll, we'll listen to your passage. Okay. This is the first night in the mangrove swamp when they had dug in. Um, we received the password as darkness settled on us and a drizzling rain began. We felt isolated, listening to moisture dripping from the trees and splash, splashing softly into the swamp. It was the darkest night I ever saw. The overcast sky was black, was as black as the dripping mangroves that walled us in. I had the sensation of being in a great black hole and reached out to touch the sides of the gun pit to orient myself. Slowly, the reality of it all formed in my mind. We were expendable. It was difficult to accept. We come from a nation and a culture that values life in the individual. To find oneself in a situation where your life seems of little value is the ulti ultimate in loneliness. It is a humbling experience. Most of the combat veterans had already grappled with this realization on Guadalcanal or Gloucester, but it struck me out in that swamp. Hey, Woody, I've lost your sound. Yep. So I muted myself there. I mean, it's very okay, hard you. for me to understand this because you know that I've never been to, to the Southern Hemisphere. I've never been to a Pacific Island. Never seen, never seen these kind of things. But you know, whether whether you're from New York or Minneapolis or Florida or Alabama, this is an alien environment, and that the Japanese have one intention that is to kill you if you're going in there. And most right. insects there are trying to kill you as well, I suppose. Right. And it was in the mangrove swamp, and they showed this in the Pacific as well. That. Um, that night, a guy cracked up and started having yeah. nightmares and began screaming. And of course, they had they were trying to shut him up. And everybody along the line is knowing everybody who's dug in is like, shut that man up. He's going to give us away because they were out forward. They, they had no backup where they were. They were forward of the front lines in that position. And then very tragically, they ended up having to hit the guy in the head. I mean, a corpsman gave him two shots of morphine, which normally would have knocked anybody out, didn't phase him. Uh, my dad said they're all lying there in their holes and it's raining and it's dark and dripping as I just described. And then they heard this sickening crunch and they'd had to hit him in the head with an entrenching shovel wow. and it killed him, you know, but, and I could read that part, but honestly, it'd be hard to get through that. Yeah. It's a different, and, and, but it, it, the thing the series does and the book does and Bob Leckie's book does, does is they convey the fact that people are dying not just through enemy action. There's friendly fire. There's that whole issue of the darkness and the trickery and people stepping out the foxhole in the series when they say, you know, why would anybody leave a foxhole without telling anybody you're going out there? But And it does show that there are people who are, you know, breaking down they're losing it mentally and there are people being killed by their own side accident and being killed because they're going out and that must have been something when you're there and you've seen the mark the markers to where the cemetery was and you're reading about the loss of life and things there that some people didn't even die to enemy action they died because of just shit happens that must have been right. something for you difficult to deal with for your father and when you're there kind of reading those passages to kind of step in these areas and think that people were killed for those reasons oh absolutely i mean that the shocking degree of violence, you know, that was required to secure an island like Peleliu is, is is hard to fathom. I mean, I remember my dad telling me, you know, if it had not been for the flamethrower, we could not have taken Peleliu. Yeah. Wow. Well, let's move on. We've got lots more to do. So we're going to move to my mm. second PowerPoint now. And we're going to move to the, to, the, to the other little island off an island. And this um, is another important action that, that your father was involved in and where we get to the, the, the famous sledges bunker there. Right. So, um, but this is an, another, another, another 
mission another day and so it just carries on the unrelenting misery comes up so set the scene for for, for what for this for this patrol for this sure movement. so Ingecebus is a very small island even smaller than Peleliu <clears throat> a few hundred yards across the channel um as you see on on the great map there by the way um I think that's straight out of the USMC monograph if I'm not it mistaken is, yep. but okay um <clears throat> but it was determined that it, this happened on D plus 13, so September 28th, uh, K-35 was sent across to secure Ingecebus because as the Marines moved north on Peleliu, up around Hill 80 and so forth, they were taking shell fire from Ingecebus. So it was known the Japanese were there in strength. There was also an airfield there, and it was determined that we needed to secure that. And, and also to prevent that being used as an offloading point for Japanese reinforcements coming down from Koror, you know, farther north. So that is why on 13 days into the battle, uh, my dad's outfit was sent across to attack Ingecebus. And also, because I'm a huge aviation buff, Ingecebus is where one of the greatest examples of close air support by Marine Corsairs for infantry. And it was provided by VMF-114, uh, the Death Dealer Squadron, uh, who had set up shop on Peleliu at that point, led by by uh, Major Robert Cowboy Stout. Yeah, no, so that's going some, across. Yeah, support is 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 invaluable <clears throat> there, and it's something that you know. Again, to, to the boots on the ground are important, but the the the, the air power there being so influential there. Um, uh, but the different kind of nature of combat, you know, that your father's dead with nothing to drink at some well not now he's got water by now but right. first couple of days nothing to drink and then these pilots are kind of nipping back to an airfield and having coca-cola and donuts probably. well <clears throat> that is true but can, can i read a little bit right yeah there? sure please do our amtrak's moved to the water's edge and waited for h hours the thunderous pre-landing naval gunfire bombardment bombardment covered the little island and smoke flame and dust the course here is from marine fighter squadron 114 peeled off and began bombing and strafing the beach the engines of the beautiful blue gold wing planes roared, whined, and strained as they dove and pulled out. They plastered the beach with machine guns, bombs, and rockets. The effect was awesome as dirt, sand, and debris spewed into the air. Our Marine pilots outdid themselves, and we cheered, yelled, and waved, and raised our clenched fist to indicate our approval. Never during the war did I see fighter pilots take, take such risks by not pulling out of their dives until the very last instant. We were certain more than once that a pilot was pulling out too late and would crash. But expert flyers that they were, they gave the beach a brutal pounding without mishap to plane or pilot. We talked about their spectacular flying even after the war ended. Wow. And and as the Corsairs pulled up and peeled off, then the guys from K Company were debarking from their Amtraks. Pretty much had the Japanese at bayonet point immediately. And Capture Japanese later said that was that was an awesome, that was one of the most incredible bombardments we've ever been through. I mean, we never had a chance to even retaliate. And it was yeah. it was one of the first times that that Marine close air support had been provided solely by Marine aviators. I don't think it was the first time, but it but it certainly was an iconic event and beautifully executed by VMF 114. Yeah, well, it's it's worth mentioning because we when we did the shows about um even Guadalcanal, which was um uh, uh, yesterday, and we talked about New Guinea uh, last week, is great yeah, amazing great how story. much difference two years made in terms of what power the Allies have behind them in forty four that they didn't have in forty two and even forty three. You know, the, the the Japanese are now on the back foot. The Allies are on mm -hmm. the front foot. We now have the productions cranked up. We've got more of everything. Our supplies, our logistics. We've simply got more aircraft in the air, more ships on the sea there. So, so by the time your father joins combat, you know, as harrowing as it was, there is this massive arsenal of democracy behind us. So we, that the allies can do this kind of firepower that, you know, when we talk about the Kokoda track and Milne Bay, those epic actions of two years earlier, oh, yeah. when the air power was, was, was not as good. It wasn't as much, it wasn't as plentiful, amazing bravery, amazing pilots, but the, you know, the Corsair, Absolutely. for example, and the, was, was a, was a, was a, uh, something that was much, much better for doing what it was doing. Oh, yeah. I mean, it could take a tremendous pounding, just a beautiful airplane. Yeah. So the bunker, 
So um, we've got some more photos. Your photos are when you were there, and we've got Brian's photos right. there. So again, this is another <clears throat> pivotal scene in the t in the TV series. Lots of things happen right. there. It's 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 kind of a a, a crucial point there. So t you can either read your father's account first, or do you want to talk about your experience of visiting it? Let's do your yeah, father's I, account. Yeah, sure. So okay, so reading from with the old breed here. Snafu and I began to set up our mortar about five feet from the bunker. Number one mortar was about five yards to our left. Corporal R.V. Bergen was getting the sound-powered phone hooked up to receive fire orders, fire orders from Sergeant Johnny Marmette, who was observing. I heard something behind me in the pillbox. Japanese were talking in low, excited voices. Metal rattled against an iron grating. I grabbed my carbine and yelled, Bergen, there's nips in that pillbox. All the men readied their weapons as Bergen came over to have a look. Kidding me with shuck, sledgehammer, you're cracking up. He looked into the ventilator port directly behind me. It was rather small, approximately six inches by eight inches and covered with iron bars about a half inch apart. What he saw brought forth a stream of curses in his best Texas style against all Nippon. He stuck his carbine muzzle through the bars, fired two quick shots and yelled, I got him right in the face. The Japanese inside the pillbox began jabbering loudly. Every man in the mortar section was ready for trouble as soon as Bergen fired the first shot. It came in the form of a grenade tossed out of the entrance to my left. It looked as big as a football to me. I yelled, grenade, and dove behind the sand breastwork protecting the entrance at the end of the pillbox. The sand bank was about four feet high and L-shaped to protect the entrance from fire from the front and flanks. The grenade exploded, but no one was hurt. Uh, that So let me just jump to where that is right there. Uh, okay. So the spot where I'm in was, was that was one of the coolest moments of my life to be able to, for Eric Maylander to put me right there. The Japanese tossed out several more grenades without causing his injury because we were hugging the deck. Most of the men crawled around to the front of the pillbox and crouched close to it between the firing ports so the enemy couldn't fire at them. John Redifer and Vincent Santos jumped on top. Things got quiet. I was nearest the door and Bergen yelled to me, Look in and see what's in there, Sledgehammer. Being trained to take orders without question, I raised my head above the sandbank and peered into the door of the bunker. It nearly cost me my life. Not more than six feet from me crouched a Japanese machine gunner. His eyes were black dots and a tan impassive face topped with a familiar mushroom helmet. The muzzle of his light machine gun stared at me like a gigantic third eye. Fortunately for me, I reacted first. Not having time to get my carbine into firing position, I jerked my head down so fast my helmet almost flew off. A split second later, he fired a burst of six or eight rounds. The bullets tore a furrow through the bank just above my head and showered sand on me. My ears rang from the muzzle blast and my heart seemed to be in my throat choking me. I knew damn well I had to be dead. He just couldn't have missed me at that range. A million thoughts, I'm almost done with this passage. A million thoughts raced through my terrified mind of how my folks had nearly lost their youngest, of what a stupid thing I had done to look directly into a pillbox full of Japanese without even having my carbine at the ready, and of just how much I hated the enemy anyway. Many a Marine veteran had already lost his life on Peleliu for making less of a, of a mistake than I had just made. And that, what you just had right there was me looking, that's my view looking down into the bunker, which yeah. in 1999 was you know, filled with those mangrove stumps and water and, and, you know, Eric Maylander and, and Sean Price and another friend of mine who was there and all the other guys, you know, they all, in fact, somebody had, had actually uh, copied some, these pages of this exact firefight. And, and we were reading from it as we looked at the bunker, but I mean, we were thinking, man, to be able to pump the water out of that thing and just, uh, and in fact, if you can see on the wall behind me, Right there, that is a Japanese bayonet that my dad got from a Japanese soldier, a dead Japanese soldier after they killed them all. Uh, I think they ended up killing seventeen. But uh, I, I, I'm running out of superlatives of how great this is. But <laughs> this is Brian's trip there. This is so. This is 2017. That's five years ago now. So it's been cleared around the bunker yeah, a little bit more than tours, when I was there. Tours go there a bit more regularly now. People you know, go on these little kind of almost like golf caddy things around there and go up there and see it now. So this is Brian there visiting it. And you know, again, if you've seen the TV the TV show, you can see these. They, they recreate it really, really perfectly with the little they square did. opening in the grill there. And um, yeah, so you said earlier, but I'm going to go bring it back to when you said that was one of the greatest moments of your life standing there. So, you know, <laughs> these are sort of classic trite 
interviewer questions. What was it? What did you feel like being there? I mean, <laughs> yeah. honestly, what you know, what what was running through your mind there? Oh, I mean that that was actually what Eric Maylander had told me was the that particular bunker. And Eric had been to Peleliu probably six times prior to that. And so this, I think that trip in 99 was his seventh. And they had not been able to locate that bunker prior to that. But right. he he had a lot of information. He had talked to he had talked to my dad, he had talked to other uh other veterans, and he, he felt really optimistic that we were going to be able to find it. Um, and then he was a little ahead of me going through the jungle trying to locate it. And, you know, when he did find it, I heard him, you know, yelling jubilantly, and, and I ran to the position where they were. I was about 30 yards behind him, which in that jungle is actually a pretty long way. But, uh, you know, I literally shook uh, Woody. I mean, I can't think of a better way because I'm – you know, I mean, in that spot right there, Eric nailed down. He said, Henry, you would have never been born if your dad had been a split second too late or later than he was, mm. you know, and pulling his head down. But yeah, I mean, and it, it, it is that moment when you've got to know combat veterans as I have. And my, you know, my own uncle was on Sword Beach, you know, that, that it can be a very, very fine line between living and dying. You know, you make one tiny, tiny split second error of judgment or you go left when you should have gone right or, or just bad luck there. And, but as you have, as I've taken people on tours and other people watching, to be there with someone or a relative of someone who was in a moment where their life could have been ended right then and it wasn't is, is a truly mm -hmm. profound experience. I've got – so. The the entire the procedure for knocking out these bunkers with with deeply entrenched Japanese was they would call in armored support they would call in a a, a Sherman tank to fire at seventy five or an armored LVT to fire its seventy five into the wall of the bunker to cave it in and they then they would get a flamethrower up and if you want I can read a little bit of that from yeah the please do yeah no, okay. no no we'll take anything we can get. So what's happened is they the Japanese are tossing grenades out. A few of them have run out, and my dad and his buddies are toppling them with rifle fire as they try to get into the bushes because, you know, as my dad said, we knew if they got out there and got into the bushes, then we were going to have a real problem. We wanted to keep them bottled up. So here we go. The Amtrak took up – so Bergen goes back. He brings up an Amtrak. The Amtrak took up a position on the line even with us. Its commander, a sergeant, consulted Bergen. Then the turret gunner fired three armor-piercing 75-millimeter shells at the side of the pillbox. Each time our ears rang with a familiar wham, bam, as the report of the gun was followed quickly by the explosion of the shell on the target at close range. The third shell tore a hole entirely through the pillbox. Fragments kicked up dust around our abandoned packs and mortars on the other side. On the near side nearest us, this hole was about four feet in diameter. Bergen yelled to the tankers to cease firing lest our equipment be damaged. Someone remarked that if the fragments hadn't killed those inside, the concussion surely had. But even before the dust settled, I saw a Japanese soldier appear at the blasted opening. He was grim determination personified as he drew back his arm to throw a grenade at us. My carbine was already up. When he appeared, I lined up my sights on his chest and began squeezing off shots. As the first bullet hit him, his face contorted in agony. His knees buckled. The grenade slipped from his grasp. All the men near me, including the Amtrak machine gunner, had seen him and began firing. The soldier collapsed in the fuselade, and the grenade went off at his feet. Even in the midst of these fast-moving events, I looked down at my carbine with sober reflection. I had just killed a man at close range. That I had seen clearly the pain on his face when my bullets hit him came as a jolt. It suddenly made the war a very personal affair. The expression on that man's face filled me with shame and then disgust for the war and all the misery it was causing. Wow. And just, I mean, just to say, I mean, my father was a proud Marine and had no regrets about, it. you know, there was no self-recrimination from my father about his actions on Peleliu in 19 or in 1944. So I just want to make that clear. There was no, Oh, why am I here? I shouldn't be here. There was none of that from Eugene Sledge. I can assure you. But that, but, uh, which is which is testament to your father's spirit and and how he balanced things. But of course, the tragedy is is that many men who did serve on Peleliu or Iwo Jima were broken by it and were ne were never able. You know, they may have survived, you know, physically. But these events, mm -hmm. I mean, you know, some of the events your father writes about, some they depict in the TV show and in Bob Lecky's books. You know, this isn't these aren't things 
21, 22, 23 year old kids should really be experiencing. I know the war was just, I know the Allies had to <laughs> defeat the Japanese and the Germans, but Peleliu particularly is where it just became an inhuman um, experience. He, he described it as an utterly dehumanizing experience, you know, and the fact that, I mean, imagine you go out, you get hot, you're sweaty, you come in, you take a shower, you get clean and you're, you're good to go. I mean, imagine the heat, humidity, all of that, no way to get yourself clean. Everybody had dysentery. Okay. You know, no way to get yourself clean. Uh, guys are, yeah, this is really disgusting, but I mean, it was part of the experience. I mean, my dad said, you know, when a man had to defecate, he did it in a ammo can or a grenade can or something and just threw it off to the side. So after 30 days of that, plus, you know, Marines removed their dead as quickly as they could, but the Japanese dead were lying where they fell in 115 degree temperature. What do you think that's going to be like? I mean, you know, they're bloated They're It's, it was just utterly dehumanizing. Yeah. No, I mean, we, we did the show about the Chindits last year and, you know, they, they all just reg regularly just tore out, you know, cut out the arse of their, 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 pants, right. their trousers <clears throat> because they would just walk and, and dysentery and diarrhea and, and walk and march and shit. And just, it was just the way you did it. And then because it, you, you couldn't deal with these things and that, that human misery is something that those of us, no matter how brilliant books are, you'll never be able to put yourself there. And even yourself visiting there and Brian visiting there years later, you know, again, you're going back to some kind of hotel and accommodation. Oh, Someone's yeah. got food ready for you. And, you know, it's, but it does give, it gives you, it gets you part of the way there without ever really understanding it. We, this may come up later on, but when you came back from the trip, you know, how did you, did your father ask you first to tell, oh, you, what it, tell you what it was like? Or did he, did you yeah. feel the need to tell him? How, how did that first exchange go? Well, great time to bring it up right here because so in 1999, you know, it's not like we're all walking around with iPhones and taking selfies yeah. and oh, I've got to put this on Facebook. You know, nobody was doing that back then, but uh, we, we were, once we went back across to Peleliu and of course finding the bunker was, was just like top of the list, right? So getting him back across to Peleliu, um, there was a there was telephone service at certain times of the day. Well, I was able to call my dad. Uh, 1999, he he didn't pass away till March of 01, and he was still in pretty good um, he was still in pretty good shape at that point. And I was able to call him and say, Dad, because you know he knew about Eric Maylander. He and Eric had corresponded, and he knew that we were going to try to find the bunker, um, and. I was able to call him and say, dad, we found the bunker. Wow. You know, and I said, I, I tremendous amount of pride to be your son, wow. you know, and my yeah. father was a self. He was like, well, I appreciate that big shot. <laughs> you know, that's wow, that's, yeah, amazing. Um, we had, uh, whether it changes the tone a bit, we had a question from Peter O'Connell there about the gold teeth and the, and the, 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 the costing him his soul. Is that, do you want to share a little bit about that aspect of it, your father's recollections? Yeah, well, so in the Pacific, you know, they they portray that. And I know we don't we're not constantly trying to go back and, and critique the miniseries, uh, and even though it would stand up well. But um, they they portray Snafu as being. So my dad, he gets it in his head one time that maybe I need to maybe I want to do this. Yeah. Um, and he had seen other Marines do it. And. In the miniseries, it's Snafu says, you know, Sledgehammer, don't. It was Doc Caswell who actually did it in in the book. Um, and my father realized that Doc Caswell was just trying to help my dad preserve that last shred of humanity. Yeah. Um, and once, once that happened, I mean, my father never considered that again what he did do and they, they also showed this was he did cut off some collar insignia yeah which this is one that i have i have others but he did do that um but there yeah. you know everybody had their limit and it was just peleliu drove you to yours yeah which which move, moves us on to the kind of the, the next stages there of the of the high ground because this is where thing it was just un, one unrelenting piece of misery to another unrelenting piece of misery that just went on right. for weeks and so 
you know, we have less photos from this area here, but Bloody Nose Ridge and and, and all the Five Sisters and all the other crazy names these places had there. And I'll throw a map up what we're talking mm -hmm. about here. It's not the best quality map, but it does convey, I think, just how complicated that operation was because <clears throat> you're dealing with units moving who can't see what the other units are doing because you're losing track in, in the jungle and the, the terrain and elevations and valleys and, dr and draws and you don't know where you know where some of the Japanese uh, weaponry is located, but you don't where know, know where all of it's located. And uh, you know that that they've been facing that high ground for for weeks by this point, haven't they? Effectively. Oh yeah, I mean, they would pull in, they would go in, they would make an attack, it would have to pull back. The Japanese were so you know, I think at the the end of the battle and after Intel, of course, we have years of historiography now to confirm this. I think there were like five hundred plus caves. They were heavily fortified, some with steel doors. And the Japanese were able to, to pull back into those caves. Um, I mean, that map, you're right, it doesn't convey it, but so geographically and topographically complex. Yeah. Um, and that the, the nature of that terrain was not fully appreciated before we hit the island because, you know, it was predicted initially that it'll be it'll be rough but fast you know we'll be done with Pella. yeah that's my my dad actually thought he might be in that photo but you know there's no way to know but that's i think that's going up into five sisters uh, but i could be wrong but you see you see caves pockmarking the ridges uh, you see how just the moonscape appearance of how blasted off everything is because by then they have the Marine Corsairs coming in, dropping thousand pound bombs, trying to knock out these caves. Yeah. Great shot right there. That's on five sisters. Um, you have, they were also dropping uh, tanks of napalm that then they would fire at with infantry weapons to, to detonate them. Um, it, you know, it took such a combination of force to try to root the Japanese out of there. Yeah. And th this is where we, when we talked about how, different it looks today from how it looked then is that if you were to go in these areas you can still see the gradients you can still see the height of it the idea of this blasted <clears throat> landscape of course you can't convey that today but you must have had a sense when you're climbing up paths there on this tour of just again the physical difficulty of getting up these okay you know perhaps you weren't 21 22 when you did it but and and, right. and as fit as a marine but uh it, you get the, the sense of just how intimidating it was phys physically. When you get up into, I think it was the area of China Wall and, and certainly around where uh, Colonel Nakagawa's final command post was, which there's a picture of Eric Maylander and Colonel Alexander and myself posing in front of that cave. Uh, I mean, there there are some ridges where there are actually lines that you have to pull yourself up by. Yeah. You know, they've strung ropes up there that have been left, you know, because people do visit, visit these areas now. And, uh, and you see there, the, the Corsair has his, his wheels down to act as a, as a dive break. And also because they were so close and now that pilot chose to retract his landing gear, but, um, you know, that it, it's been famously described that their bombing runs were so close that the pilots were taking off and not even retracting their landing gear. I've seen on a warbird site where a guy posted who flies warbirds and would know this, that that's not the case. They were retracting their landing gear and then deploying the mains in the Corsair. You could deploy the main gear as a dive break, but leave the tail wheel retracted. I think what actually was happening was a combination. It was up to the pilot. I mean, they would take off, make their runs. In some cases, they may retract their gear and that, that pilot did retract his gear. And then in some cases, they may have done the dive break function. I think it was an individual thing, actually, on the part of the aviator. <clears throat> yeah. But there's a question about whether supplies are an issue by this point. And this is where it depends what supplies you're talking about. Because there's, I'm going to guess by this time, there's plenty of ammo coming in. But, but yeah, people aren't getting replacement uniforms. They're not getting the comforts yet. But the, in terms of waging a war... After right. the shortage of water on those in the first forty-eight hours, that's kind of been more or less corrected by now. But Absolutely. you know, you're not, you're, you're not getting you're not getting the hot meals. You're not getting the you know the the the, the packs of um you know toothpaste and stuff like that. That's still on its way coming through. But in terms of 
ammo and waging the war, things are things are quite good back at the beachhead by this point on. Oh, absolutely. I mean, yeah, you had you had you had plenty of ammo coming in. There was never an ammo shortage. Now that was a problem later in Okinawa, but that we're, we're not here to talk about that. But but no, plenty of ammo coming in. But you know, you bring up a great point, Woody, because I remember my dad writing about it because I did a recent reread <clears throat> of of his book. Um, you know, in the movies, it's like the ammo's just there. They always have plenty of it, but people had to bring it in. And I mean, that was an incredibly difficult task to bring in, you know, cases of 30 cal rifle ammo, uh, you know, 30 cal military ball and cases of mortar shells and every other damn thing that they were going to need, you know, five gallon uh, jerry cans of water. You know, I mean, nothing was easy on Pella. The terrain made everything difficult. No. Yeah. We've talked about that on other shows. I mean, it, you know, when you get to Iwo Jima later on, the, the drinking water wasn't just coming from a, a few dozen miles away. It was pretty much coming from the USA almost. I mean, it, the, the, the tail to bring everything everybody needed to the front line was, was, was thousands of miles. You know, the, Absolutely. We talked about before the incredible role of the transports. I always think of that, <clears throat> that great film uh, and based on the play Mr. Roberts with Henry Fonda where he's feeling guilty because he's on a transport. He's just going back and forth across – the ocean supplying stuff but that was an incredible part of the pacific war that that without those ships just going with bringing that everything you needed it, the, the, the war would have run out of steam very very quickly yeah and you had on peleliu you had to have the the lvt was just such a such a great machine because you had the lvts bringing the guys in and the assault waves the first three waves were assault waves you had and then you had the lvtas with with 75s on them as one was used to help take out the bunker on Inga Sebus that we described. But, you know, my dad talked about one of his buddies was a, a was an LVT driver from Mississippi, and then they'd get a chance to talk periodically. Um, and those LVTs were just one, running up and down West Road, taking wounded out and getting shot at by Japanese, which, you know, my dad said one, and this actually uh, was not put into with the old breed, but I'm doing some research on my dad's unpublished material. Um, and more to come on that later. But he had a conversation with his buddy who was an LVT driver. Uh, he got back from Bloody Nose Ridge back down to close to the airfield to offload. He had six guys, six wounded Marines in the back of his LVT. Every one of them had been shot by a sniper, dead while he was mm -hmm. in transit. Yeah. So to, to describe an event like that, it's kind of easy to understand why there was so much bitterness towards the Japanese on the part of the Marines and the soldiers who had to fight. Them. No, definitely. I mean, that's come up on other shows that the ETO and the Pacific theater, the Eastern front, uh, Eastern front of Pacific rivaling for the nastiest theater. There's some grim stuff occasion, the ETO, but it's not, it's not like this. And you know, with the wounded, I mean, we could do a whole show and we have done shows about just the risk of infection to wounded and things like that, you know, because right. the injury might be the same, whether it's sustained in Italy or Peleliu, but on Peleliu, the temperature, the the rotten everything, the the dead bodies, as you say, Japanese still lying in the swamp stair, the risk of infection, uh, like which we bring us back to the teeth story again. It was the risk of catching things, germs. I mean, mm -hmm. the, you you could be you could be patched up from your wound, but then the infection actually bring you down and kill you. Definitely. I mean, so, corn, well, yeah, go ahead. The, and the Corman. Yeah, the Corman were incredible. We'll, we'll, we'll move on towards Hill 14. We've got lots more photos of miscellaneous photos and relics and the things that were found there and are still being found there. So um, Hill Hill 140 is, is, is another key part of this ridge line here. So tell us about your father's experiences in, in this area and, and the Marines generally. Yeah, Hill 140 was uh, close to the northern part of the Umar Barogel. Um, and that, that is, that was on my list of places to go to because my father did write about it. We did not get there on my trip, but just logistically, we couldn't make it happen. I mean, you know how it is, Woody, you've yeah, been yeah, battlefields yeah. all over the world. You got so many places you want to see, you can only get to so many of them. Um, I did not get to Hill 140, but I wanted to. Hill 140, uh, although it was not described, uh, nominally in the Pacific, it was shown because that's where ACAC, Captain Haldane was killed. Uh, and Captain Haldane was the the skipper, the much beloved skipper of K-35. And, and he was tragically shot by a sniper uh, there. I'm trying to find where, I mean, he described that. If you want me to, I can. Yeah, please do. Yeah. Uh, okay. So here's Hill 140. 
Shortly, the driver stopped and let us off in a supply area where we waited for an NCO who was to guide us up into the ridges, which would be Hill 140. During, directly, the rest of the Company K mortarmen arrived with directions to reach the company. We horse, hoisted our mortar and other weapons and gear and headed across the road. We picked our way around the end of the ridge, then headed up a narrow valley filled with skeletons of shattered trees jutting up here and there on the slopes amid crazy angled coral masses. Johnny Marmet came striding down the incline of the valley to meet us as we started up. Even before I could see his face clearly, I knew from the way he was walking that something was dreadfully amiss. He lurched up, he lurched up to us, nervously clutching the web strap of the submachine gun slung over his shoulder. I had never seen Johnny nervous before, even under the thickest fire, which seemed he seemed to regard as a nuisance that interfered with his carrying out his job. His tired face was contorted with emotion. His brow was knitted tightly and his bloodshot eyes appeared moist. It was obvious that he had something fearful to tell us. We shuffled to a halt. My first thought was that the Japanese had slipped in thousands of troops from the northern Palau's and that we would never get off the island. No, maybe the enemy had bombed some American city or chased off the Navy as they had done at Kuala Canal. My imagination went wild, but none of us was prepared for what we were about to hear. Howdy, Johnny, someone said as he came up to us. All right, you guys, let's get squirted away here, he said, looking in every direction but at us. Okay, you guys, okay, you guys, he repeated, obviously flustered. A couple of men exchanged quizzical glances. The skipper's dead. Akak's been killed. Johnny finally blurted out, then looked quickly away from us. I was stunned and sickened. Throwing my ammo bag down, I turned away from the others, sat on my helmet, and sobbed quietly. Those goddamn slant-eyed sons of bitches, someone behind me groaned. Never in my wildest imagination had I contemplated Captain Haldane's death. We had a steady stream of killed and wounded leaving us, but somehow I assumed Akak was immortal. Our company commander represented stability and direction in a world of violence and death and destruction. Now his life had been snuffed out. We felt forlorn and lost. It was the worst grief I endured during the entire war. The intervening years have not lessened it any. Wow. It's... Uh, and the, it's the in in the book in the tv show it's that kind of suddenness is that you you are as an audience if you're watching the show kind of led to believe he's going to be immortal he's going to cut that like right. he's going to be like dick winters in band of brothers and he, he's going to survive exactly. the war but of course he doesn't and it tells you again when they get onto that high ground there those ridges it was just you could be the best soldier in the world. You could be you could be doing everything right, but just bad luck happens and a sniper and a shot. You know, you've got to turn a corner, you expose yourself there, and you don't, you know, you said about the intel, the lack of intel the, the allies had before going to the iron. It's that of course they know the currents, they know what time tide is gonna be, they know the basic terrain there, but you with all the will in the world, you could never have worked out where every single J Japanese gun is on those <clears> on those hills. It would be just a down to Marine infantry and, and, and the army later just going right. up and, and doing what they can. And basically when you get shot at, that's when you know where the enemy are. Exactly. And and again, topographically, with the complexity of the cave system, the rel the the cave system made that it, it was ideal terrain for defense and depth. Yeah. And um, yeah, and the Japanese kept on getting better and better at it as the war went on that next um, you know, seven or eight months it went on after this. But we've got the last set of photos are kind of the random ones. These are some of the things that were found when you were there. Then later on, Brian's photos of things that are still being, being found on this battlefield. Because it is, as you said there, the difficult of getting it. It is very, very remote. And you can't sure. if, if you <clears throat> can't take stuff off the island very well. So there's just stuff everywhere. And that there are signs up even today saying, you know, the trail has only been cleared to X number of feet mm -hmm. either side of the trail. And the New Zealand government did a lot of excavation work a few years ago. But it's... It's a dangerous battlefield to this day, isn't it? It is. Um, do, you, do you want me to describe the pictures? Yeah, you, you just just jump in and talk what you want to talk about. Yeah. Right there, you see a live Japanese grenade on the left. Um, I don't know that I included a picture of it, but I have a photo of me on our trip kneeling by a Japanese grenade that we found just inland from White Beach. On the right there is... I took that photo. I'm not sure. I think that was up in Bloody Nose Ridge somewhere. Uh, that is the remains of a, sh that's a shell with a human vertebrae on top of it. Uh, and we, we placed, we saw the bone and placed it there. You know, we found it in a cave and placed it there. It was not there naturally. 
uh, I mean, the, the human remain was there, but we placed it there for the purpose of the photograph. Yeah. And we'll, we'll just go through these and just jump in with what your comments sure. are. I think that is an 81 millimeter mortar shell. Looks it to me. Yeah. With the, the band stripes there on it. Mm -hmm. um, and that's you. Yeah. That's me by a Japanese zero fighter, um, which, you know, I'm loving the aviation aspect of it. Like I do it, it just to find a, and, and, you know, there was no extant Japanese air power by the time uh, the land battle rolled around. That had all been knocked out in, in U.S. task force carrier raids previously. Um, so there was no Japanese air power still on Peleliu, but lots of knocked out Japanese airplanes around the island. And that was uh, the remains of a Japanese Zero fighter. That is coming down from Koror. Uh, a Japanese Zero had crash landed in the water. And one of my great regrets, Woody, is I, I, it was on my list. I wanted to go back to that airplane and they have it marked with a buoy. It's about halfway down from Koror in fairly shallow water. But they say that in, and when the tide is out, you can sit in the cockpit. And wow. I wanted to go back to that and do that very thing. Um, but just couldn't, couldn't make it happen logistically on my trip. Well, maybe you'll get back there again. Maybe we'll all go. Maybe you, me, JD from History Underground, we'll make some kind of group pilgrimage there when we're all millionaires. I don't know. We'll yeah, do that. I, I, it's on, I definitely want to take my wife and son. So that is a Type 41 Japanese 75 millimeter field piece. And I've got a little piece to, to contextualize this, to use your word. Yeah, please. Um, please do. Let's see. All right. So what I'm reading here, that's up in the Bloody Nose Ridge on Peleliu. What I'm reading here actually a Colonel Ingecevus, but it, let me, let me just jump in here. There was little firing going on now because third battalion fifth was preparing to pull back as it was relieved by an army battalion. Our tanks, two of which had been parked near us, started toward the beach as they rattled and clanked away. I hoped they weren't leaving prematurely. Suddenly we were jolted by the terrific blast of a Japanese 75 millimeter artillery piece slightly to our right. We flung ourselves on flat on the deck. The shriek and explosion of the shell followed instantly. Fragments tore through the air. The gun fired again rapidly. Jesus, what's that? Gasped, gasped a man near me. It's a NIP-75, and God, is he close, another one said. Each time the gun fired, I felt the shock and pressure waves from the muzzle blast. I was terror-stricken. We began to hear shouts of corpsmen on our right. For Christ's sakes, get them tanks back up here, someone yelled. I looked toward the tanks just in time to see several wheel around and come speeding back to help the pinned down infantrymen. Mortar section, stand by, someone yelled. We might be called upon to fire on the enemy gun, but as yet we didn't know its location. The tanks went into action and almost immediately knocked out the weapon. Calls came from our right for corpsmen and stretcher bearers. Several of our ammo carriers went with the corpsmen to act as stretcher bearers. Word filtered along to us that quite a number of casualties had been caused by the terrible point-blank fire of the enemy cannon. Most of those hit were members of the company that was tied in with us on our right. So that is a picture of me by a Japanese 75 millimeter Type 41 field piece. Brilliant. And that's that up in the bloody That is a Jap our Japanese Type 95 tank that had been hit. And I think... It, it had been knocked on its side. You can see the undercarriage still charred from flamethrowers. Uh, but when on my trip in 1999, it was, uh, you know, the tank was pretty much completely sub submerged uh, because it was in like a mangrove swamp type area. And uh, I remember Eric Maylander commenting that it's possible the remains of the crew were still inside. Good grief. <clears throat> That is Colonel Joe Alexander standing with me uh, in a Japanese gun emplacement. I think that is a Type 96 25 millimeter Japanese weapon, and I'm holding the remains of an American helmet. Yeah, inc incredible to, for us to kind of share in your experience there. For those of us who haven't been there, this is nearly as good as going. There's obviously this is more vertebrae. There. Yeah, more, human, um... human remains that we saw in a cave. Uh, and it looks like we set them on a portion of a field piece, but I honestly can't remember. 
And were you when you went as a tour group? Were, were you given any? I mean, your, your tour leader. Were you given a briefing about what to do and what not to do, and and how and to keep together and not go off the trail? We were, we were because, and I think actually, Woody, I think a lot of the ordinance has been cleaned up. That right there, uh, man. If I could have brought that home, I would have. That is a, I believe that is a case of sixty millimeter mortar shells, which. For people who are familiar with my dad's book, he was a 60 millimeter mortarman. I could be wrong on that, but I think that's what that is. I had captions written in the book where I had these pictures, but I, I just, the way I, when I, you know, reproduced them to send to you, I couldn't get the captions too. Yeah. Um, if that's not a case of 60 shells, I do have a picture of that. But um, yeah, we were told don't, don't pick up any live ordinance because obviously as you've already seen, there's tons of it or there were tons of it lying around. I think a lot of it has been cleaned up since I was there in 1999. It's been, according to Brian, it's been cleared in some areas, other areas they haven't touched yet. It's the, yeah. the Korean government have, have started systematically right. and they're trying to focus on the areas where tours go and where it's needed for, for, for day to day life. But there are other areas that just haven't been done at all. So and, and these, you know, the cave network and the tunnels. I mean, it, I, I guess it probably hasn't all even even been charted yet. I guess there Pro still must be things that are still to be discovered. Probably not. That's inside a cave up in up in Umar Brogel somewhere. Sorry, I can't be more specific for people who know the topography. But that is Japanese canteen, um, some human remains. Any canteen that we that we saw had a hole in it. That's because the Marines were shooting holes in them, so the Japanese uh, could not use them to go get water and, you know, water was a premium, 115 degrees fighting day and night, water was a premium. So anything that could uh, be used as a water container that the Marines found, they shot a hole in it. And that's a Japanese canteen. More human remains somewhere up in the Umar Brogel. Now these are Brian's photos. So these, these are ones okay. from say four years ago now. So you can see, um, they, there's still stuff there. Um, you know, well, they're, they're, it's rusting away more. The, the humidity there is going to you know, gradually damage these things. Um, this is you know, machine guns, uh, all sorts of things still being found there. So, um, yeah, it's it's still a daily thing where things get found there. So, so again, you see the thank you to Brian there, yeah. for sharing these amazing photos. Right, certainly. <clears throat> yeah. And a tank on its side, which is a yeah, pretty cool thing. That that is that is a tank from the 710th tank battalion. It's an army tank. Um, Gil Lindloff was on our trip. That was his tank, although he was not in that tank that day. Uh, that tank, and I found this out in ensuing years, uh, Woody. What happened was that tank was going up to try to retrieve, I think, some people who had actually gone up souvenir hunting in the caves. Um, it ran over a Japanese bomb that had been planted as a mine. It, the bomb exploded, gutted the tank. The tank burned all night. Of the crewmen, I think several of them were killed outright. A couple of them were evacuated and died on a hospital ship later that night. Um, the tank was put up on its side. I thought for years that when, the, when it ran over the bomb that, that gutted it, then it blew it up on its side. What I have found out, I believe, is that the tank was put up on its side so that the undercarriage could be pilfered for parts by okay. um, by our by our guys because they needed. You know, those were rough conditions with coral. It was tearing up the undercarriages of, of the tanks and the Amtrak. So they went out and got the the bogey wheels or the treads, whatever they could. So that's why the tank was actually put up on its side. But but it was a horrific loss of life for the crew when they ran over the bomb and knocked it out. That's inside it. Yeah, no, definitely. And um, we got a question about whether your father encountered mines and or booby traps on this on this environment. I don't recall him writing about. I know that that was commonly done. Uh, I know that it happened a lot on Okinawa. I don't recall him, and that's I think a stack of. 60 millimeter mortar shells. It's 60, I think, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Um, and man, I'd like to have brought a few of those home, but I, I think getting them through the airport would have been a bit of a problem. Um, I think so. But, you know, I don't recall my father talking much about booby traps, you know, I mean, growing up when my brother and I did, you know, being kids in the Vietnam era and watching movies, you know, the, the word, the term booby trap was commonly used 
because that was quite a problem for the guys in Vietnam. Um, it certainly did happen. Um, but I've seen, like, I've seen archival footage, not of Peleliu, but on Okinawa, where the Japanese would take a can and fill it with metal and nails and things like that and yeah. bury it, you know. It, yeah, it definitely happened, didn't it? We, we, we've all read about it, I think. So, yeah, I mean, we're, we're coming to the end now uh, where we can have a couple more questions from the viewers. But, the, of course, there was a cemetery at the time, and then now there's the mark of the cemetery, the graves of elsewhere. But this, this, this is the one well, of the first ceremonies there. I think this is 45 or 46. I'm right. not sure. Um, and this is the same area. This is Brian's visit in 2017. And I remember know, walking by that monument in, in 99. And you know, for someone, you know, your, your father lost lots of friends there. This is a kind of a, an odd question because I, being British. We British and Commonwealth, we, we have 2,000 sites around the world where we buried our dead because we would localize them generally to, to, the, to where they fell. So some of them are just two or three graves or a few dozen. The, the U.S. system was to, to group people together in the, in the central cemeteries. Just a personal question. If you, when you went to Peleliu, do you think it would have been, would you have, would you have appreciated going to see graves had they left the American Marines and Army who fell there? Would you have, have, have been appreciated seeing them there at Peleliu? Or are you happy with the fact they were relocated elsewhere? Knowing how my father described their Marine dead were always taken out. You know, they were never left where they fell. Uh, for the Japanese, obviously, they were going undercover, you know, as the battle just got, as we encroached more and more on their territory. Um, so, you know, it never really occurred to me to see Marine remains on the island. I mean, I, I knew that they had been repatriated. And, and mm -hmm. you know, a lot of them, I think, were, you know, the sad part is, I mean, I know we saw this on Ingusibus, uh, and I took some pictures of it. I don't think I included those pictures to you, but we would see these large craters and the guys I was with were like, Oh yeah, well that that's where a 16 inch shell detonated, you know, and it left a, a very appreciable large crater, you know, 20 feet across or something like that. I mean, when you had cases of guys going missing in action, it's quite possible and quite probable that they were vaporized in an explosion like that. Yeah, no, definitely. I mean, it's just, it's just, you know, when, when we do a show with an Australian guest and we talk about the fighting on New Guinea, there, you know, there is a Commonwealth War Grave Cemetery there, so men are buried, right. you know, maybe just a few miles away from where they were killed, and it, it's just mm -hmm. the different way our countries do it. JD on History Underground has done some filming at the Normandy Commonwealth Cemeteries and the mm -hmm. Normandy American Cemetery, and it's just over the years, as the years pass, I wonder whether. Uh, visitors, if you're if you've got a relative who was lost in a battle, and you go to that place, and there's a cemetery in that place, you you can visit there, and you can see those who fell for that island. Whether that's sort of a I don't use the word better, but a more a more richer experience than going to mm -hmm. a cemetery hundreds or thousands of miles away. Can I give you an example of not an infantryman, but I believe so. The commander of the Marine Fighter Squadron VMF 114 was Major Robert Cowboy Stout. Um. And I'm collaborating with his cousin Damon on a, on a film, his distant cousin Damon on a film about VMF 114. But uh, Cowboy Stout was shot down and killed by Flack over Karor, March 4th, 1945. Um, long after my dad and, and the 1st Marine Division had been pulled out and sent on to prepare. Uh, at that point, they were getting ready for Okinawa. VMF 114 was still on Peleliu, flying from Peleliu as a base on strike missions up into the Northern Palau Islands. On March 4th, 45, Cowboy Stout was shot down. Um, his body was found in 1947. I believe his remains were interred first on Peleliu, I believe, and then he was sent home. I could be wrong on that. He might've been sent directly home. Um, but, and I've actually seen, because I, I have a lot of paperwork on him since I'm collaborating, collaborating on a film, about VMF 114 and about Cowboy, it's it's really moving to see the telegram sent home to his parents, saying, "Dear Mr. and Mrs. Stout, we we have found Robert's remains and they are buried in plot so and so, plot so and so, mm -hmm. row row so and so, plot so and so." Um, you know, to read that, you know, and, and being a father myself, I mean, I, I can't imagine. First of all, to, to find out that your son was KIA, and then to find out that, well, we found his remains and, yeah. and his were still in the cockpit of his Corsair. Wow. 
up around Corora, actually. But uh, I, I maybe spoke around your question. But well, no, no it's, it's fine. It's just it's just it, it's 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 all valid. But um, two questions. We'll do them. We'll kind of bring bring things to an end. One, you kind yeah. of hinted at what your current project is now. So so what next for Henry Sledge in terms of of your own study in the Pacific Campaign and your own project? Well, actually, since you bring that up, uh, well, I am collaborating on a film about VMF 114 and, and Robert Stout with Damon Stout and Chad Summers. Um, Damon is a distant cousin of, uh, of Cowboys and, and a good friend of mine now. And um, we're, we're doing a film, uh, Damon's the lead on that, about VMF 114 and about Robert F. Stout. Um, and also, for, for me personally, um, my father's book with the old breed, which people know was 315 pages published. His original manuscript was 834 pages. I have worked with the archivist at Auburn university where this was kept. And I now have the original unedited manuscript from which with the old breed was published. I have gone through and highlighted all the unpublished material in the original manuscript. Uh, I wore out, probably four or five highlighters. <laughs> and my plan, Woody, and I hope you and I stay in touch on this because I, I hope we have a lot more work ahead of us. My plan you can be sure of it. Yep. is to do a book with selected portions of the unpublished manuscript interwoven with my recollections of growing up with Sledgehammer and him talking about a lot of these things. I mean, a lot of these things that people have read about in this book um, I grew up hearing about, yeah. so, you know, it's, um, I mean, it, to give you an idea, this is not all of it, but that's some of it, the unpublished manuscript. You've okay. just made lots of amateur historians smile. I think, I think people watching this have yeah. suddenly gone, my God, there's that more information out there. It's, there's yeah, a lot wow. of, there's a lot of good stuff in there. What do you I mean? If, if for people who thought with the old breed was good. Now, obviously, the best stuff was published, okay? But, uh, you know, my father worked with an editor uh, in 1980, 79, 80, 81, when, when With the Old Breed was being uh, put together, and a lot of good stuff was cut out. Now, a lot of it might not be as compelling as what's in With the Old Breed, but I think there's some great stuff in there. And <clears throat> uh, I think a lot of it's really compelling. And so my goal is to do a book. Uh, your friend and mine, uh, John McManus yep. is, I, you know, all I want to say is John is very much in my corner. Uh, John's a busy man. He doesn't know I'm giving him a shout out here, but he's a busy man. He's got a lot of his own stuff going on. But John and I have talked uh, and he is very much in my corner to give well, advice that, and coach. That would be that would be amazing. And you know, I was talking to uh, someone on the podcast a couple of days ago. I think the way forward for me or for, for us to understand this is not just books, but bo books as part of a media package. So if, if for example, a new edition, a different edition with the, the extra bits, the unpublished bits, your recollections, your memories, perhaps another visit back to Peleliu to take it, if that could be coming out and then connect to kind of a website with video footage, the locations, color photos, because that's the thing. As wonderful as your father's book is and Don Baguettes and Bob Leckie's and all those other classic works we have, Right. Not very many illustrations in them in most editions there. And we now have, as you said, there we've got Google Earth, we've got digital archives, we've got those aerial photos. If if, if in the future books come with a, a page of links to here's your extra resources, <laughs> right. uh, that would be amazing. And and on that question, to, to answer, ask a question about that, you know, you, 1999 was when you were paying Lou the first time. And, and, right. and if you were to go back now, with more information, there's more digital archives, there's aerial photos. You, there's obviously places you'd like to go that you didn't get to the first time. But would how would you approach it differently? What would you want to do? Um, you're older, wiser. The world is different now. You've got children of your own now. What what would well, the yeah. next visit be like? <clears throat> well, I would take my son, my 13 year old, with me, which he probably won't be 13 by the time I get back to Pelu, but. Um, he is very aware of his grandfather and, and what his grandfather did, but in my wife, I would want her to go to, and I think they would have an interest in that. But, um, a lot of people I would want to be on that trip. I would want Damon Stout, my collaborator on our film about cowboy. I would want Eric Maylander if he could go. Mm -hmm. And I would want, uh, Brian, our buddy, Brian Dimitrovich. I would yeah. want, 
Yeah. My buddies that I co-host uh, What's a Scuttlebutt podcast. I hope I can give that a shout out. Yep. Don Abernathy and Jeff Cop said I would want them with me. I, uh, you know, Dave Holland, who you just had doing a superb job on Guadalcanal. Um, I would love to have him because he's a fellow Alabama boy. I hope he's out there watching, uh, you know, to, to traipse the jungles and go through that terrain um, would just be an amazing experience and to have my family with me, you know, would, would just be incredible. And I hope to make that happen. And I hope I've got a book of my own with yeah. not seen before material from with the old breed out there behind me at that point. That would be fantastic. And it's, it's a collaborative process. If you go to the battlefield with other like-minded people, you ask questions, they ask questions you wouldn't think of asking. They point out things. You can run through theories and say, I wonder if it was up this slope there. That sounds like that description there. Do you think it was that slope there? When you're on your own, you're kind of not brave enough to kind of put the ideas out. But if there's a group of people who all know the story, you can. it's amazing that kind of collective wisdom. Yeah. Mysteries can be sorted out. You can, you know, and now we could go there with phones and things and pull up your Google Earth and pull up this. And, and have your iPads with the footage. Well, that must be that location there. There's there's work to be done. These battlefields that are, are more distant are still in many ways untapped in terms of, of how we can get our history. The Eastern Front is the same. We've, we know Market Garden. We know Normandy. People have right. traded those grounds a lot. But Peleliu, Guadalcanal, Iwo, well, Iwo Jima is difficult to get to. But there's, right. there's work to be done on those locations. I think that the next generation of historians will take it forward, I think. Oh, there, there's so many places on Peleliu I'd, I'd like to see. And, and I'd like for you to be there with me, would you? I mean, yeah, I was going to say, you, you need a Brit for balance, I think. Oh, no, absolutely. To, I mean, give some British humor and stuff. Don't, it can't just be American. And Dave Holland with his with his hybrid Alabama-Australian accent for, for we, color. And we got to give a shout-out to our buddy, Saul David. Saul David, yeah, he's another person who would want to come and do it. Yeah, it would be great to be some bus party of, of, of like-minded <laughs> yeah. historians. I'm, I'm excited now. So, um. Well, any kind of final remarks you want to say? This has been an amazing presentation. We've, we've literally traveled with you across Peleliu, but any kind of final remarks about what that island meant for your father or what it means to you? Well, I, I heard my father say that Peleliu for him just represented tragic waste because the island need never <clears throat> have been hit. And yeah. the historiography that we have behind us now would probably corroborate that but you know i mean the the thing is you had twenty five thousand of the japanese bottled up in the northern palau islands i mean there had to be a dam so to speak to keep them there um it is true that we didn't need the airfield to protect macarthur's right flank as he advanced on the philippines because he landed on the philippines when i remember my dad saying we got news of it and we're looking at each other going what the hell are we doing here but um Peleliu is an iconic battlefield to go back there with my family and my friends would be an absolute dream come true. Um, I'm excited about the book project I'm working on. Um, a lot of work. It's, it's early. Okay. It's early. I mean, I'm still notating what's there in the manuscript that I want to use. Um, but, you know, I, our podcast, what's the scuttlebutt that we were very proud to have you, on as a guest i mean there'll be other great things on that um yeah our buddy Leighton hughes just chimed in we happy few 506 i mean i'm, I'm going to be on their podcast here in a week or so and then again i don't know I, I hope saul david doesn't mind me mentioning that he asked me to review his manuscript on an upcoming mm -hmm book about k35 called devil dogs and yeah it, it's um, it is a small world isn't it there's a lot of us who know each other and we we, we cross pollinate on each other's podcasts and uh <clears throat> right. youtube channels and writing projects and i've known john mcmanus a, a long time now soul david a little bit less you a little bit less but it's it, it's it's an amazing this this year and a half two years we've had of covid has been tragic on many levels but on the a small positive that has come out of it is is the networking Exactly. Uh, the, 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 to, to, to moving forward, the people I know, I knew a few people around the world already, but now I know so many more. So it's been fantastic to do that. So, well, you're welcome back anytime. We, there's other places we can do. We can do um, the other campaigns and we can come back and talk about the air power. We can talk about your next project. You're welcome anytime. And, um, and, and you know that. So um, it's been brilliant, everybody. So I'll just remind people what you're coming up to and I'll come back and say goodbye in a second. 
So, folks, tomorrow evening we're nipping away from the Pacific for one night to take you to Italy in 1941 for Operation Colossus, which was the first British airborne operation of World War II to seize the, the aqueduct there. Neil Cherry is coming back on. I think it's his fourth show or third show. That would be great. And then Friday we're back in the Pacific for Saipan. I'm really looking forward. I had a chat with Steve McLeod, uh, our historian uh, test chat yesterday. It's going to be an amazing show, not just about the battle, but about the structure of a rifle company. It, it, it's going to blow your mind. A fantastic show. And then lots more stuff. Special Forces Week coming up next week. And lots of anniversary shows coming up we've got as well. So as usual, folks, don't forget to uh, to subscribe. Click the little bell to get notifications. Consider becoming a patron. Don't just support me. Support Brad. And on this day in Canadian military history, he's always here watching my shows. His channel is fantastic as well. Um What's the Scuttlebutt Post podcast? There's, uh, we have We Happy Few 506 podcast. There's lots of great stuff going on out there. So support everybody you can. But right now, I'm just going to say thank you very much, Henry, for joining us. And um, I'm going to go and have a whiskey before going to bed. So it's been really great talking to you, Henry. So um, Thank you, you for staying it? up late. No, it's great. So this is it. This is Paul Woodard from World War II TV. So I will see you all tomorrow at uh, the same time as normal, 7 p.m. GMT for a raid on Italy. Cheers, everybody. Thanks for your attention. Bye.